been talking a lot about meeting the diagnostic cutoff or the clinical cutoff. So how do we go about these diagnoses anyway? Well, this is another point of controversy. There's lots of different ways this is done around the world, but in Canada and the US, the primary form that we do this is through a manual and it is have a purple cover and it's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or for short, it's called the DSM-5. It was published in 2013 and it's the fifth in its order. And so it's changed radically over the years from its earlier renditions. And in the fifth edition, what is outlined is the symptomology and the diagnostic cutoff criteria criteria for 512 disorders that are classified into 20 groups. Now what's really important here is just reading the book and reading about the symptomology is not enough to make a professional diagnosis. A professional and trained clinical psychologist would know the diagnosis and the symptomology along with other things they would gain from a clinical interview. And this is why it's important that the book is not used just frivolously and a reading the book frivolously could result in what's known as medical student disorder. And this is when one reads the symptoms and sees a little bit about themselves in many of the symptoms to the point they overdiagnose themselves with many possible disorders. And so that's why we have to be really careful when we talk about these different mental health concerns. Now, importantly, what is not in the DSM is things like psychotic, insane, and crazy. There's no mental disorder known as insane, and there's no mental disorder known as crazy. And psychotic is actually a symptom of a few of the disorders we're gonna talk about, but it's not a disorder in and of itself. And so it's really important to understand that when we use those broad terms like crazy or insane, we're really using that problematic categorical black white type of terminology. And we really know things are actually on a scale. When we think about anxiety, when we think about depression, when we think about impulsivity, they're actually on scales. So we have to be really careful about that. So the DSM has helped to improve how we view psychology and how we view clinical disorders in North America, but it's not without its criticisms. One of the big criticisms, of course, is that it is made by humans and therefore it's going to be socially constructed. Compared to some other books, such as the book used by the World Health Organization in non-North American populations, there's some things that are considered disorders in the DSM or in the, in the, or in the WHO, but not vice versa. And so because of this, because we are constructing what we consider to be abnormal or atypical or problematic, this changes. And so we've gotten it wrong as a society quite a few times. In the history of the DSM, there's been times where things such as homosexuality was considered disorder. And still today, there's a problem with how transgender individuals are viewed in the DSM. And so we have to understand that sometimes a reason why something might be deviant and might be associated with distress is not the person, it's society. We now know that being gay or being transgender is not a mental disorder, but the people that are gay or transgender may experience elevated levels of mental health concern because society stigmatizes them. We have to be really careful about what we consider to be a disorder and why. We also know sometimes the DSM considers some things to be a disorder, even though they're extremely commonplace, such as things like bereavement. Somebody who is grieving a, a death in their family might be going through a really intense period of distress where they're not being adaptive. And is that a disorder? Well, it's not necessarily a disorder if you think about, is this deviant? They might be unusual in that they're one of very few people experiencing death at that time. But if most of us would have the same reaction to such a powerful experience, can we really consider that to be deviance? Can we really consider that to be abnormal? Keep in mind, you always have to have deviance, distress, and maladaptivity in order to be considered a disorder. So if something is distressful and maladaptive, but not really considered deviant, if it's something that we're all stressed out about the global pandemic, is that a disorder? Well, it might be causing us distress that maybe a psychologist can help with, but maybe that distress should not be considered a diagnosable disorder. The lines do get blurred. So that's another criticism. And the second criticism is that the DSM is organized in a way and categorizes the disorders in a way that changes over time because it is socially constructed, but changes because it's often symptom focused rather than cause or treatment focused. When reading the DSM, it's possible for one to get the idea that most disorders in lots of different families of disorders are related to emotional distress and unable to really express and accept one's emotions. And so that, that one cause may spin out and impact lots of possible disorders. 
And so rather than being cause related, it's organized in a way that's symptom related. Even though similar people with similar life experiences might go on to have very different looking disorders at the surface because they have very different symptoms. So the DSM is often looking at things that could stem from the same problem, but just have different outlooks on the outside. And finally, it's important to note that because the DSM has gone through lots of iterations and changes, sometimes the labeling has changed and that can cause confusion. And quickly, things can become out of fashion. Some of this is done for the right reasons, of course. We want to change and move away from labels that are stigmatizing. Uh, but then this can also lead to some communication breakdowns. So for instance, what we now know as bipolar disorder was previously called manic depressive disorder. And so you may have people in your family, you may have some older family relatives that were diagnosed with manic depressive disorder with an earlier DSM before 1994. And so they may know that as their diagnosis rather than bipolar. We also know that there has been changes to the autism spectrum disorders. We previously had a diagnosis of Asperger's and now that's taken away and that's all considered autism spectrum. That can be really challenging to a person who really embraced their label of Asperger's and they saw that as something qualitatively different than a diagnosis of autism and now it's all considered the same. We also have some things that have changed just to help reduce stigma. For instance, what we now know as illness anxiety disorder was previously called hypochondriac. And that was because hypochondriac was considered to be very heavy label. It was considered to be problematic and a lot of people viewed it as uh, perhaps you're causing your own illness. We now know that's definitely not the case with hypochondriasis. And so to move away from that, we try to refer to it as illness anxiety. And you might be familiar with some of the terms previously used for intellectual disability. They're considered to be very stigmatized terms today. The most recent being mental retardation. Although that was still used in clinical communities and still used in publishing communities up until 2013, we've tried to move away from that since then. And previously there was other clinical labels used for intellectual disability. In fact, things like the word moron, idiot, and imbecile started off as medical terms but they slipped into the popular language and they became slanders. So that's why we try to use a new term that has less stigma associated with it. And so that is just a quick brief history and a definition of what we mean by abnormality. Next, we're gonna start jumping into some of these types of disorders, again, organized by their symptomology rather than their causes or treatment.